Hello everyone, that Williams guy here for another episode. We're recording this on Sunday, November the 20th at 12.04 p.m. Eastern Time. And joining me today is Eric Lund, who has been on two previous episodes, if I remember. How are you doing, Eric? I am doing well, thank you. Uh, before we get started with today's show, we do have to make one big disclosure so that you can use it when you evaluate anything Eric has to say. Uh, Eric and I were on the range together this week, and he he brought up the idea of a scandium framed 44 magnum revolver and we had that discussion and then he gets out a nine millimeter pistol with a compensator on it and uh, i don't know how those two two worlds it's like ant matter and anti-matter and so uh, eric I, I just don't know man well, I am a firm believer in the wise words of Clint Eastwood, who once said, a man has got to know his limitations. And I, um, I have no concept of my limitations with a revolver. So a Scandium 44 Magnum seems like a nice, lightweight, good idea. So I think I might try it out and uh, learn some very hard lessons. Yeah, we're, we're having that discussion, and then out comes the appropriate CZP-10, Yes. But with a but with a comp on it, like, oh, these two don't go together. Well, you know, <laughs> comps are all the rage now with all the 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 in crowd. I mean, aside from the fact we've been running them on pistols and competition since the early '90s, probably even the late '80s, and they were always gimmicks that would get you killed on the range or on the streets. And uh, and now that a couple of well known uh, people have used them or recommended, now they are. Uh, I guess considered the uh, the go to setup now. So, uh, and I have to thank you for the CZ. I, I really do. I love that P10 of all of the striker fired guns that fits my hand the nicest. I shoot it the best, and uh, I have become a big fan of that. And then, of course, what we talked about and what you talked about previously about red dots on on handguns. We've been doing them in competition for decades and have a lot of experience with um, how effective they could be, you know, the employment and, and all of that. But, you know, it was only a couple of years ago that you and I would do a class or we attend a class where 80 or 90% of the people would show up with irons and you'd have that one or two guy, you know, that would, that would have a dot on a pistol. And now it's totally flipped right. to where it's, you know, 80, 90% of the guys show up, have dots on their guns and only one or two guys will show up with just irons now. And, uh, I think it was Aaron Cowan or somebody who had a discussion, uh, with him over at Sage Dynamics about, <clears throat> you know, or, uh, some of the other guys that you've had on that, that do red dot handgun glasses. And, and we're getting to the point where we don't have to specify red dot anymore because the bulk of the people are showing up with a red dot to begin with. And so it's a interesting dynamic, but uh, yeah, love, love that. And of course, then there's the whole, you know, the application of compensators beyond just making it flat. You know, it's, it's your, um, the chances of your little dog killing you are very, very low, but they're not zero, right? <laughs> so the chances that a compensator is gonna help a nine millimeter shoot a little flatter, maybe low, but it's not zero, you know? And, and clearly if uh, in, in the world where tenths and hundredths of a second mean a difference, guys are running comps because they make a difference on some level. Comparatively speaking, nah, nine millimeter, you really don't need one, right? But yeah. if you're looking to squeeze maximum performance, out of a platform you know that's part of the the equation that helps you do that and uh but beyond that you know the the combative applications you know is is one of the things and you you took that video um you know the muzzle flash is, is the muzzle flash gonna create like the revolver muzzle flashes you know when you try and shoot a uh a 357 snubby out of a two or three inch barrel with 125 grain you know are you going to get this massive fireball from a comp now, we know that duty ammunition is specifically designed with flame retardants in it to reduce muzzle flash. But I was curious to see with just regular ball training ammo, 
if it was at least in that platform with that barrel length and that ammo. And I, most of the time I didn't even see a flash. And occasionally when I did, it was just so mild that um, the color and tone of it compared to the black knight didn't, didn't phase me at all. And uh, so of course now the next thing will be is, you know, how, how, how does it affect me in extreme close quarters, retention shooting positions? Am I going to get a whiff of, of gas or is it going to pepper my face and be like, that's another hard lesson I learned and I'll never do that again. So Yeah, the, the video Eric's referring to is uh, we were out on the range in the dark the other night and he had his P10F with a compensator on it and I took a video of him shooting with it and there was virtually no flash whatsoever. Uh, coming out of the gun, I was actually a little surprised. I, I, was, I was too. I wasn't expecting big fireballs, but I was expecting more flash than than what we saw. You know, and I think I wonder how much of that is a um, is an effect. The fact that that's a full size, almost five inch barrel, you get plenty of burn. We were running, you know, one hundred forty seven grain ball. You know, so we don't have the the higher velocities, the larger powder charges. Um, you know, it, uh, and a lot of those factors come in, but at least that setup with that ammo was uh, was virtually non-existence. And yeah, that did kind of surprise me too. I expect a little bit more of a flash. Uh -huh. So, all right. Well, today's topic is we're going to get into some of Eric's recommendations for uh, defense in the home. And uh, before that, just really quickly, Eric's been a long time cop. If you count being a state cop and a federal agent. As being a cop I, I don't know just uh, uh just don't call me highway patrol right yeah. That's, I, I i don't want to insult the highway patrol guys <laughs> and uh because i was i was state police not highway patrol there's a uh, difference i have to give you credit for that you have actually answered calls other that, that did not involve taillights that's right uh, um that and then, then all of his years as federal agent. and he has shot competitively for sig and fn and uh that teaches long range shooting now we'll, we'll we'll get into where you can find him as far as that goes in those classes at the end. Um, very knowledgeable gun guy. I met Eric twenty before twenty thirteen or so. And Ooh, for a second there, I thought you were going to say like twenty years ago, and I'm like, yeah. don't put a don't put a two in front of the number of years we've known each other. I'm not I'm not ready right. for for that for life to move that fast. Right. I, I met we met each other before the. Uh, um, found the open enrollment circuit so it would have been 2012 2013 at an ILFE master instructor class um and been been great knowing you ever since and and of course uh one of the bigger influences on me and, and my development um and i always like to like to, to to say thanks for that um eric is about to set out to break the internet because he's going to talk about some suggestions for home defense and they may be contrary or defense in the home that may be contrary to uh some of the popular uh, recommendations out there but he's also going to put it in the context of level of an experience level of shooter slash gun owner and uh eric take it away yeah so um i noticed that you had several episodes that have caused quite a stir and and uh i like that i i like causing stirs getting people fired up getting them emotional about topics and maybe trying to force them to critically think of what about what they're doing so i had seen a previous video out there um, on youtube about you know some guys that the, the the creator of the video went to some experts and asked them their recommendations and some of them i agreed with and some of them i didn't and it kind of just got me thinking about you know a lot of the videos that 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 I've watched with you and a lot of the videos that you do really focus on the instructor development, the training side of it, the technique, you know, the, the preparation, the employment. And I thought, you know what, maybe it'd be just be good to uh, just dive right down in gear once in a while. Let's, let's get back to, you know, you're, you're in that gun store and you overhear that conversation of, of a new shooter comes in and you hear him having a conversation or them having a conversation about, well, you know, times are getting crazy and, and I just want something for around the house to protect me and my family, you know, so this is going to be kind of in that context where we have a relatively beginner shooter, um, you know, may have shot before, maybe have not, 
uh, maybe has been to the range with some family members or friends, you know, has some exposure beyond the raw beginner, but may only have been to the range two or three times, maybe in a calendar year, um, or they may have taken a class, you know, an eight hour class for their concealed weapons permit, you know, so they have some knowledge, they're safe, they can handle the guns, they're making a conscious decision about, you know, times are getting a little crazy or, you know, uh, the the idea of of protecting themselves or their family or homes is kind of for whatever whatever that stimulus was is kind of kind of spurred them into looking into this topic and so that's that's kind of the area that we want to talk about because there's a lot of new shooters that are coming in you look at the data there's a lot of new um, new people that are getting into firearms and becoming more aware of it with the videos and the laws and just everything that's happening so I thought maybe this is a, a good opportunity to just um, get back down to that level and just let's talk some gear and some recommendations and some some things to think about and maybe put out some information to some of the other guys that follow the channel and they're more experienced or some of the other instructors out there and really just kind of take a moment and critically think what we're putting out. So that's that's kind of the context. And and so uh, along with that, I figured out, well, how can I break the internet and make this interesting too? And I'm like, I know I will crap all over the two sacred cows of home defense, which are shotguns and revolvers. <laughs> yes. I won't need a minute. Uh -uh. <laughs> so uh -huh. I'll start out with my recommendation, right? right? And then I'll go into why I don't necessarily like those other options. And then hopefully I'll circle back to, uh, the options that that I would recommend and, and kind of maybe tie it all together as to why I think um, they may be some better options. Sure. So uh, my recommendation for for that for those people that experience level would be some type of striker fired nine millimeter. Right now I'm going to say Glock 17s 19s. Uh, if you have smaller hands 48s. Um, but along with that, go all of the striker fired series. So any reputable company, I mean, obviously uh, I've had the CZ. They haven't had necessarily the, the longevity. I think you were just saying some police department in Kansas just adopted them as their duty gun when we were talking the other night. But any of those, uh, Walther makes a really good nine millimeter. Um, obviously the MP series is very strong. The 320 for me, the SIG series, it's a, I'm, I'm still a little bit out there. You know, we're starting to, you know, the gun seems to be reliable from the firing aspect, but there's some other factors going on. <laughs> hey, no. Uh, yeah, my guard dog. Hey, nine. So there is some uh, other factors going on, and that may be one of my sons coming in. So uh, oh. we'll see. He, he may decide to pop in. Sure. But um so it goes with all of that. You know, I don't have a lot of experience with the Beretta um, nine millimeter, the polymer striker version. But I mean, there's one of the things that Glock did for us is it kind of solved the equation for making a very reliable nine millimeter pistol in a striker polymer package. So now here we are some 20, 30 years later, and all the other manufacturers have had exposure to it. They've taken it apart. They've scanned it. They've done measurements. They've checked feed ramp angles, you know, all, all the engineering and geek stuff that tells you why this pistol is so reliable. And they've kind of, in their own version, copied those formulas. So I think there are a lot of options for extremely reliable striker fired nine millimeter pistols out there now i'll use the word glock because it's just easier to use that as an umbrella for for that class of pistol but uh so some version of a nine millimeter glock or uh, you know a, a comparable setup or um yeah an ar um whether it be a 16 inch or whether it be the new the new pistol variations, um, maybe with a little bit of reservation, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But just a standard 16 inch, um, I think that is is another good option. So, so uh, having said that, I'm going to dive into 
why I am not a fan and primarily of shotguns, right? And I will start with the, let me classify this by saying pump action shotguns. Now, and let, let's clarify, you are talking about for be, beginning. Correct. Inexperienced people, because I, I know you're quite a fan of a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but but, we're, but we're, the context is, someone's walking into a gun store you're, you're a gun guy and someone's calling you hey i'm worried i want to get something to keep around the house what are your suggestions this is where the context of the conversation is correct correct it's it's i'll get to semi-autos but right now you have this and it's perpetual right in in the industry and it just in the community is that pump action shotguns are the best, most reliable option that you can have. And I will take issue with that in that I think pump action shotguns are some of the most unreliable shotguns out there. Now, let me qualify that statement because I, I can already feel the keyboards typing the hate. The hate is growing, right? The hate and the burn is understand that all firearms are systems. There, there's a there's different type of systems. Firearms like a pump action shotgun or a lever action rifle is a system that requires the the human interface is an integral part of that system. So on a pump action shotgun, you know the classic Remington 870 or 590s for the 590 guys. Mechanically, that is a very reliable system. But what makes it unreliable is the human interface running that system. And so that's where I have the problem with it is, is all of the malfunctions that you and I have seen in shotgun classes that we've been associated with or taught where they're pump action shotguns and they're user induced. They forget to cycle the action, you know, or they, um, they short stroke the gun where it causes a malfunction or they short stroke it and never gets the next round into the chamber because they're, they're excited or they don't latch the shotgun shell in the tube to catch the magazine catch and it shoots back out on the carrier and jams up the gun. So from a system perspective, I think pump action shotguns are some of the most unreliable systems out there because the human interface of that system is unreliable. Now where I'll say, you know, in this scope, we're talking about beginners where I would put a pump action shotgun is I would classify that, I would recommend that to an advanced intermediate guy. You know, however we define what makes a beginner shooter intermediate and advanced, I wouldn't start making a pump action shotgun recommendation to somebody until they were on the upper side of an intermediate level shooter. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. And of course, you know, if there's anything you want to take issue with, you know, jump in. Uh, I'm not going to take issue. I'm, I'm going to clarify something here. You know, my father's generation, they grew up running pump shotguns. But that was, you know, you put food on the table with them. You did. That was what they had. And I kind of grew up with that as well, you know, being raised by that generation. And so I've been, I've had a pump shotgun in my hand since I was preteen. Mm -hmm. And I just want to clarify for the audience is he's not talking. If you're one of those type guys or gals, he's not talking about you. He's talking about the novice, the newbie. And you, know, you mentioned the lever action rifle. I, I am a deer dearly beloved lever action guy uh 
the greatest benefit to the lever action rifle where I would prefer it for me over the AR is the lack of mechanical offset with the sighting system. Mm -hmm. However, if we're going to stay in the context of the novice, the experienced person, there is one huge flaw with the system because you're talking about the human interface. If you pick up that lever action rifle and you run the action to chamber around, you now have a cocked hammer. Mm -hmm. Okay, to put that lever action back into a safe condition, you have to manually lower the hammer. And that's actually the very first thing we do in my lever action rifle class before we, act, you know, we even load the guns. We make sure they're into and we start practicing that, mm -hmm. that technique. And so you're expecting a, a novice to be able to do that when they're shaking, when their hands are, you know, they're, 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 they're nervous, their hands are, are jittery, everything else. And that's what we're specifically what we're trying to avoid. To me, it's, I've done it so much. I wouldn't even, I can, I can do it without a level of automaticity. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about my neighbor two houses down that comes over and knocks on the door one day and says, Hey, uh, I know you're kind of a gun guy. Can you help me here? Right. And I just want to, I just want to make sure we're keeping the audience in that context. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a great point. I mean, I came up, my grandfather, you know, exposed me to the hunting and the firearms. And it was through Remington 870s, um, both 12 and 20 gauge. And I still have them. And, uh, and then correspondingly, when we got into rifles, I didn't get into bolt guns. He had the Remington 760 and the 7600s, which were, you know, slide action rifles mm -hmm. because the operation was virtually identical to a shotgun. And so I learned all of that, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade at a young age, how to run that stuff. So yeah, you, you know, if, if you have that kind of background coming up, and that kind of experience with those systems, then yeah, modern day, now, now you are not a beginner. You're in that intermediate category we're talking about. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a good distinguishing point. Um, so, and I'll, I'll come back to the semi-autos after I touch upon the revolvers and why I don't like revolvers is they are tough to shoot i mean when you look at what typically gets recommended for beginners or for women are some version of a snubby or some version of a three inch revolver and you can smith and wesson colt taurus you know you can slide anything in there it's it's a class of gun you know they oh look this is a small cute little gun it's a 38 or a 357 it's a two or three inch it'll sit in the nightstand under a handkerchief you know and it's there's your peace of mind but you grab that thing and it's yeah is it reliable yeah for the most part they are you pull the trigger and you know you're going to get five or six rounds right but now you look at at the performance of it right you're gonna get that huge muscle flash we talked about especially in low light uh you're gonna have what and you have more experience with this but is it fair to say something between like an 11 to a 14 pound double action trigger on a lot yeah. of those guns from the factory yeah depending on the manufacturer and when it was made yeah um so extremely heavy trigger pulls which are not conducive to accuracy um short barrels short sighting radius which once again difficult with accuracy um some of uh, the specialized guns you might get some better sights or some ninth sights but obviously you know the smaller uh snobbies tend to have what do they call them those um oh what are they the gutter sights mm -hmm. where they just have a groove in the top strap they don't even have a rear sight you know, these, I mean, things that are designed for, uh, and I'm going to date you and I, uh, for fighting in a phone booth, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I, I don't think a lot of the newer people know what a phone booth is nowadays. <laughs> but uh, yeah. and you of know, course, I'm I'm sitting here picturing all of the people traveling back home from the revolver roundup this weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, you know, Tuesday as they're hitting their flights or getting in their cars to drive back from, from gun site. Right. And they, they downloaded this episode and they start to play it. And it's just all the gnashing of teeth that that's going to Oh, yeah. Them. The cool thing is they're going to be trapped in a tube for three hours. They won't <laughs> be able to do anything. Um, but, yeah, so uh, – and then when you look at the capacity, you know, five or six rounds, they are um, not quick to reload for a beginner. Um, I, I'm going to interject here. They're not quick to reload for for an expert. <laughs> um, Tom Givens has been studying this stuff for well over forty years. He says he has never found evidence of a successful reload during a close range gunfight. Now we're not talking guys behind barricades, you know, you know, in cover, popping off rounds at each other, like in the parking lot fighting at the car in the house fighting successfully reloading the revolver i had a phone conversation with dave spalding last week and i asked him that question and he's not familiar with one uh so if those are the two you know pretty well up to speed historically I, with revolver you've got what you've got in the gun and that yeah it. and i think probably the the most enduring and classic example of that was jim cirillo mm -hmm. where you know, the, where he developed the New York reload, which was you throw the empty one on the ground and you pull out another one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, so when you look at those, you know, what are we asking a person to do that is is relatively newcomer to shoot a a pistol that's relatively small, that has an extremely difficult trigger to manage, that has very poor sights, very short sight radius. Um, yeah, I, I think there are, I think there are some better options out there, you know, then when you look at, even if we don't go down the road really far of should a, should a beginner put a light on a pistol, um, we can't even have that discussion with revolvers unless it's a few specific models that allow for that. So putting a light or a laser on a revolver is extremely difficult. You know, your choices for being able to do that, especially on a, a smaller compact revolver, well, um, the, become the laser, really limited. The laser is not that difficult because you can do crimson trace laser grip. Yeah, that's good. But put, but putting a light on one, the only one that jumps out of my mind is that Smith and Wesson R8, and yeah. that's not going to be something a beginner is going to go by. Right. Yeah, that's what a yeah. twelve hundred dollar revolver yeah. or something. I mean, yeah. very good looking setup and looks very yeah. capable but yeah in, in the context of what we're doing here you know I, and you see it all the time the stories about you know we haven't even gotten into um smaller statured people oh. that that may not even have the finger strength to pull that trigger in a in, in a manner that is conducive to getting you know a hit on the side of a barn right and and, and that's a physical limitation they have to deal with so I don't like revolvers for those for those reasons. Yeah. Um, I, I was that a good piece of advice decades ago. I, you know, I I, I think we could have an, an episode about that. Yeah. Um, but with the current technology today, with the current number of offerings that are out there from the from the multitude of manufacturers, with the reliability and the durability that they have within the um, nine millimeter platform, I just find it extremely difficult to make a recommendation over that type of revolver over a semi-auto for these uh, for these applications. So, so now it kind of brings us back to, and even if I was limited, I mean, to show you where I'm at on the pump action shotguns, I would recommend a revolver over the pump action shotgun for the new guy because at least with a revolver if you can manipulate the trigger you're going to get five or six or you know if you get a specialized one seven or you know some version of that okay. on a shotgun first of all if you even if you carry it cruiser ready as we know which would be magazine tube chamber empty one did you remember to rack the shotgun Right, because that's the selling point, right? That that noise, and I'll agree with you, there is no other noise like that. And if you've ever shot a gun or been in the industry and you hear that echo around the corner, oh yeah, you know exactly what that is and you know exactly what you're in for. 
but is that a good defensive tactic? No, <laughs> I, I don't want you to know that I'm around the corner racking the shotgun, right? right. Um, so let's make the assumption that one, they didn't forget to, 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 to put around in the chamber and to cycle the action, or they may have started with one in there. So you give them that first round, and then that's where every, uh, that's where the, your disaster factor now goes to the roof, right? They have to work the action. They have to work it vigorously. They have to remember to work the action. I mean, we've seen guys try to pull triggers multiple times on shotguns, not remembering to cycle the action. Or to deactivate the safety. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so even from that perspective, I know with a revolver, if you can manipulate the trigger, you can get five or six right if things go south of the shotgun you're going to be lucky to get one and then of course let's not even get into the whole if you don't cycle the action properly or aggressive enough malfunctions with shotguns don't take seconds to clear <laughs> they, yeah. they can be significant yeah. and if the operator induces a malfunction you essentially have a kind of a funny colored baseball bat <laughs> because that's yeah. about that's where you're at. You know, shotguns are not intuitive to run. They're not intuitive to load. Um, pushing the round in the magazine tube on the on, on a surface discussion is real simple. But how many times have you and I seen experienced guys not get the shell past the shell latch comes back on the carrier and geeks up the whole gun uh -huh. and now it was such a problem that remington had to change their lifter to make a slot so you could get a tool in there to push now i mean now you got to pull out a tool if this is low light you need i mean it's just it's a disaster waiting to happen if if the disaster factor on a pump shotgun is so high that virtually anything that goes wrong is going to take you seconds to minutes to clear it. And I don't mean like tap rack. I mean, like maybe the shell came back, you didn't get it all the way and your, your spent hull is kind of hanging out your ejection port and you mm -hmm. see it and you swipe it with your hand and get the next round. I mean, that's about the best malfunction you can hope for. Anything else is just gonna be that. I mean, how many times have we seen guys load shotgun rounds into the magazine tube backwards oh yeah and yeah. that is a disaster or guys that do combat loads and grab the shotgun and throw it in the side gate backwards yeah uh tom givens and i noticed a couple of years ago at a shotgun instructor class on um, the mossberg pattern shotguns uh, a couple of instances of people who are doing an emergency load or combat load, whichever term you want to use. And all of a sudden they've got a shell dangling down through the lifter. And Tom was trying to figure out what was going on with that. And I finally figured out the cause is I watched someone throw a shell into one backwards brass forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what caused it. If you do that, it will drop down and it will hang in the lifter. And then you're not like you're saying, you're not clearing it quickly. Now, for the purpose of this discussion and shotguns in general, okay, that's probably not going to happen in the home environment because you're not going to probably not going to be doing an emergency release of your shotgun in that situation. Uh, I don't know of any situation where someone took more than one or two rounds of buckshot center mass and didn't stop them. No, no, I would agree with that. And, yeah. and within the context of what we're talking about, because yeah. you and I and, and a lot of the people, your, your listeners and stuff, mm -hmm. because we're in the community, in the industry, we're enthusiasts, mm -hmm. we have to remember that a lot of times for us, the definition of victory in that type of scenario is yeah. bullets and bodies and people on floors. Yeah. But the, the better victory is they see it and they get out the house. Yeah. And we call the police where mm -hmm. there is no shooting. So a lot of times a victory is just, you know, if they see that I have a gun or I have some type of weapon that I'm going to fight back. And of course, 
people that want to do that, a lot of times they don't expect resistance. And when they get resistance, that totally messes their plan, right? right? Changes the OODA loop for them. And now their only thing is we need to get out of here, you know? So, so having a zero shot engagement in a home defense situation is still an outstanding win, right? So I would agree with you that, you know, you get two or three rounds of a shotgun off, especially pump, you know, um, yeah, that, that it, only the most hardcore guys that are committed are yeah. going to stay and, and keep slugging it out with you, right? They're yeah. going to be, they're going to be doing some version of trying to suppress you so they and their buddies can get out and get away. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the the typical burglary scenario that people picture of someone coming in the middle of the night doesn't. That's not an actually a valid scenario. Typically, a residential burglary is during the daytime when they think the home is unoccupied. Yeah, that or um, and, and another reason why I I don't necessarily like the revolver is the limited capacity. When we look and consider home invasions, right? We have a tremendous amount of video of home invasions where there's the, where it's just one subject is rare. Normally it's multiple. And so when it becomes multiple, you know, every round in your, in your firearm is the ability to solve a problem. And the idea of, even if it's just two guys that try to kick in the door on some type of home invasion, I would rather have more than six or more than five available. Now, shotgun, we're still kind of get into that though, right? I mean, yeah, across a room, there is nothing that can compare with the brutality of a shotgun, just nothing. And, but once again, the trade-off for that brutality is round count, right? A lot of our, if you don't get the extended versions, you got four and one. Right. If you get the extended versions, you might get six or seven in one. Right. And then and that's why we have the side saddle. So e- even the shotgun itself is still a, a relatively low capacity weapon. Now it's devastating across the room. I, I can't make an argument against that, you know, um, and I, it absolutely has a place and it has a place for a certain skill level user. But in the context of what we're talking about here, I can't I can't make that recommendation for for a shotgun for 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 the new shooter for home defense i I think there's just too many things that can go wrong um and we haven't even gotten into um the fact that most shotguns the length of pull on the stocks are too long uh that it's difficult not impossible but it's difficult to put an effective white light on them um it can be now this is isn't the the semi-autos um but it can be difficult to put some of the accessories. The things with shotguns is minimum mandatory federal law is 18 inches, not 16. So they're going to be longer. So when you look at a longer shotgun with an extended tube, with a probably a stock for the average person that's too long, that they're not going to get modded. I mean, they don't fit the shooter well. They don't fit smaller statured people well. They have a tremendous amount of recoil that you got to manage. I mean, there's just... There is a tremendous number of trade-offs to get that that awesome brutality across a room, and I don't think it's I don't think it's a good recommendation for for the new shooter. I, I think there's too many downsides to to employing that system, mainly the human the human error. Um, when you have other options, I think that are just better options for those people. So, so yeah. yeah. Uh, having taught a bunch of rookie cops and doing basically beginning shotgun classes for instance i helped i don't know an armed women of america uh state shoot here a couple of weeks ago i helped steve havey teach three blocks of shotgun to absolute beginning novices now we got them up to speed pretty quickly but a couple of them said this isn't for me i'm out Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah but a c- couple of them mastered it pretty well didn't master it, but they, they got the hang of it pretty quickly uh but they're also shotguns that steve and i have set up 
Mm -hmm. So they had the Magpul stock with the with the length of pull short and everything. This isn't walking into a gun store and buying an off the shelf eight seventy or five ninety with the fourteen inch length of pull stock. Yeah. And there is a huge, huge difference in how that gun with the twelve and a half inch length of pull versus the fourteen inch length of pull handles. Huge, huge. Like for instance, um, I hated the Benelli Super 90 M1 with the 14 inch stock. When I took it and had it chopped to 12 and a half inches, I loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. But I knew to do that. Right. And was willing to go to the expense and, and find someone that could do that. Again, for the others, we're not talking about you guys that are gun guys. We're talking about the advice that you give to the person that comes to you for help. And remember, they aren't you. Right. And they recognize that you are the subject matter expert and so we have to we have to be be careful about what we what we make recommendations to because they're going to put a lot of they're going to give a lot of weight to your opinion your opinion matters to them which is why they came to it and so that's why you know i, I thought this was good to let's let's sit down and critically think about some of the choices that we're giving so now let's jump into semis because semis throw a little bit of kink into it now um would i recommend a semi-auto shotgun for a beginner well, still for some of the reasons, like I'll switch my my uh, my recommendation up slightly, where I would I would recommend a quality semi-auto over a revolver. All right, especially the ones that have the proven track records, like your Benelli's or the new Berettas. You know, the new Beretta 1301s are uh, are outstanding. I think. You know, it's it's interesting to me that, and, and this is going to be a little, uh, we're going to run down a little rabbit hole on the side, but it's interesting to me that time and time again, you see companies that rest on their laurels and rest on their reputations, and the fact that they rested on their reputations and didn't modernize or improvise allowed other companies to jump into the market and have gotten to the point where those other companies have either overtaken the previous companies or they've stolen so much market share away from them that now they're direct competitors on equal footing, where if the original company had just innovated a little bit, they probably wouldn't exist. For example, Colt 1911s, right? Back in the early to mid 90s, in USPSA and IPSC, you know, Colt single stacks were still the premier setup, right? But, you know, what did you get from Colt? You got a Colt that was right off, <laughs> right off the same line that they made for your granddaddy or your dad in World War II. It didn't have any of the custom features. But what was everyone doing? Everyone was buying Colts, sending them to gunsmiths, paying thousands of dollars and getting back with the safeties and the beaver tails and the throat and the polish and all the things that they needed to take that platform and make it competitive. And then lo and behold, in the mid nineties, who appears? A little company called Kimber. And then Kimber starts offering pistols with all of these features, good quality pistols with the features that people wanted. And uh, for, the, for the people that are throwing stuff, he's talking about the original Kimbers, not what it's become. Go ahead. Right, right, yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, Kimber started showing up left and right everywhere because people were getting Kimbers with all of the high quality accessories and aftermarket upgrades that they wanted in Colts, but didn't have to pay an extra two or three grand to have a custom gunsmith turn, turn a Colt into it. And it took years before Colt even really committed to starting to offer some of those more modern variations. And by that time, Kimber had established a footprint. And so if Colt had had done that ahead of time and read that market, I doubt Kimber ever really would have gotten a foothold or been that successful. Right? You see it in the optics industry with Aimpoint. Aimpoint was the red dot and has been the red dot for the longest time. But people wanted variations, right? They wanted different reticles. They wanted different options. They wanted different sizes. And Aimpoint, especially you'll see this in the optics industry 
um, in my experience has been more than any other part of the industry is they really have the mentality of our design engineers know what best we'll design it you shoot it we don't care what you want or what you think we know best and aimpoint kind of took a little bit of that path right i mean what was aimpoint's offering a simple red dot that was rugged and durable and ready for military use and they excelled at it but did they offer different reticle designs did they offer smaller platforms no it was just the straight old aimpoint what we know the patrol rifle optic right that full size you know and they kind of got there and they stayed there. Well, then lo and behold, <laughs> what pops up? Some little company, little startup company called EOTech offering red dots. And then they started offering different reticles. And then they started offering, you know, not just red, but green. Then they started offering small packages. And before you know it, EOTech's got contracts with the military that Aimpoint lost out, where if Aimpoint would have just listened to the end market and innovated and offered some new upgrades, EOTech probably never would have existed. And now, now that market's wide open. And we see the same thing again now with shotguns, with Beretta and Benelli. I'm with you, man. I, I love my Benelli. And you know, we had Benelli's at work uh, before the longest time. And I had a documented 12,000 plus rounds on my short barrel entry M1 Super 90 of nothing well, I can't say nothing of of probably 95% or more of nothing but buckshot or slug. Never had a malfunction, not a single one. And um, and then you look at all the guys in competition that ran Benelli's. Same type of of reliability, right? But what's Benelli's biggest problem? What we just talked about, man. I love their pistol grip shotguns. But their stocks are horrible. They're way too long. The pistol grips are too fat. For the longest time, they didn't put any type of Picatinny rail on the top, you know, and they just never really innovated. And then what happens is now you get Beretta, which is the same type of operating system, comes up on the market. And now, is it Artis Industries yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that offers all that stuff? Now a... a, a a company jumps up that makes all these in product improvements on the 1301, which is a great, and now the 1301 tactical, you know, kitted outright is probably the premier shotgun on the market today. Is it expensive? Yeah. But when you look at performance, when you look at being able to put lights and optics, being able to swap the stocks and configure it so it fits you, you know, your slings, just all the things that go with it, they're doing it right. And it's leaving Benelli by the wayside. Now, Benelli has lost that share. Now everyone goes to it's nothing but 13 or 1s. And, and I'll say this, by the way, to any of your people out there, if anyone knows a little small company that makes a stock adapter, like for the 1301, so you can use the Magpul stock, but a Benelli version, you know, <laughs> leave a comment in the YouTube section or something, because I have been looking for that for the longest time, because I right. love the Magpul stock on the, on the shotgun, but I can't find an adapter that'll work yeah. with Magpul with Benelli's. So if yeah. anyone knows, I, I'd really appreciate that. So, oh, so no, yeah. I would recommend, I would recommend a good semi-auto because now we're back to, it's removing the human element from that system. Right. And they, they have proven to be pretty reliable. Well, let me interject here. My 1301 is a gen one shotgun. And I got it as the gen twos were being released and there was a distributor that got the full all that was like all the gym ones that were left and we're trying to distribute them or get rid of them and i paid right at 600 for my 1301 and then of course i put the magpul stock on it with there this adapter and a couple of other uh, changes looking right now at one of the better online vendors that is out there a 1301 tactical is 1409 dollars mm-hmm Okay, that's not what the person we're talking about is going to typically walk into a gun store and be able to just, just drop that kind of scratch on one. Um, and it's not even available right now. They're out of stock. Yeah, no, um, no. Completely yeah. agree with you. That's that's not what you're, you know, unless yeah. 
unless they've got yeah. more money than they know what to do with. Yeah. And the salesman works his game really well, you know, but yeah, yeah. no, I completely agree. That's, that yeah. is, that is a premier top of the line shotgun that the, the right. beginner shooter in this context probably is not going to lay out the money for. All right. And when, when we're talking about semi-auto shotguns, I have high hopes for the Mossberg 940, but I also recognize the source and, um, I've handled one in a gun shop and loved the way it felt, but until I see reliable reports from them and they've been out for a couple of years, I'm not going to even look down that road. And you're looking at a thousand dollars right there. Right. Um, while I'm a huge fan of the old 870Ps and Wingmasters, I've never really had that same love and affinity develop for the Remington 1100 or the 1187. Right. Um, and then you get into the whole thing with the, you know, you still got these huge stocks. You got to start making changes. Mm -hmm. You got to do everything else to get down to them. And just the cost in there. And, and one of the things that, that while we're on this cost line that comes to mind is 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you could walk into a gun store and for 200 bucks or less, you could buy a traded in model 10 Smith and Wesson, uh, 19 something along those lines now those guns bring a premium and they are vastly more expensive than what i traded in gen 3 glock 17 is going to run mm -hmm. uh, and even if you if you want to take out the whole trade-in market and everything the smith and wesson sd9 series while it's not a pistol that i would like to buy and go put thousands of rounds through in the weekends and classes of teaching I feel perfectly okay with taking that gun and using it for the scenario in which we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Stoger has a wonderful, wonderful little nine millimeter for the context in which you're speaking. Sub 400 bucks. I think it's three something. Yeah. And they're in rebates on it. And I haven't seen a negative report on those things yet. No, you're you have a tremendous number of options, right? Yeah. And so, so that rolls into kind of why I do recommend either ARs or, or a semi-auto is, <clears throat> so let's, let's take the ARs. The shootability of an AR is just so much easier when compared to a shotgun. They're going to be lighter. They're going to have a shorter overall length They've got most nowadays have a collapsible stock, so you can adjust the length of pull to anybody. Clearly, no one's going to argue against the ergonomics of an AR, the ability and the aftermarket um, support to be able to put lights and lasers and anything else you want to put on it, you can. Um, you're getting a standard capacity, not a high capacity, a standard capacity 30 rounds magazine. So if we already know from, from previous uh, research that the idea that you're going to do a reload in your home is, is relatively rare, I would rather have 30 rounds on tap than five or six. Uh, it gives you, I mean, even with these, these criminals nowadays, they're starting to finally get smart about body armor. Some of them we're seeing more and more wearing, trying to wear some type of armor. The 556 will defeat that. You know, the uh, the shotgun and the handguns won't. Uh, the recoil on it is much easier to manage for all different types of people. Now, that comes at the expense of, of how loud they are, especially in a confined space. But, uh, you know, there's always going to be a trade-off. All guns going off in a confined space are going to be loud. Um, some are going to be more loud than others, and there's there's ways to mitigate that. But, you know, that's going to be one of your trade-offs. Uh, but so when I look at that whole platform and I look and say, what does the person really have to be able to do? Um, well, if you're a person that has difficulty with hand strength or manipulations, then that's the type of setup. I mean, and of course, if you, you give me different factors and change the circumstances, I'll change my answer. But if you're in a situation where you can leave a loaded gun in your home, and not necessarily have to worry about access to children or somebody else. And maybe you're uh, a little bit older and, and that's just not your situation, but you, you, 
you're concerned about manipulation strength, well, I can load that AR and take my time and get it loaded and just put the safety on, right? And it's the same thing with, with the pistols. If I'm in a situation where I don't have to worry about somebody accessing that firearm that I don't want to, I can leave the pistol with a round in the chamber. So the idea of having some women or some smaller statured people that may not have the strength to cycle the slide, they may be able to stage that ahead of time if that's a real concern, right? And all the different techniques that myself or any of the other instructors on here would be able to show people how to overcome that. If that still doesn't work, then at the end of the day, you still have the option of, of having the gun loaded to start with. <laughs> so uh, most of your ARs nowadays, kind of like with the Glocks and the nine millimeters, we've kind of, for the most part, figured out the um, the riddle of the 556 five, in the AR, right? We understand how to make them relatively reliable. We understand the port size, the pressures, the rounds, the different, I mean, we, we've kind of solved that problem, how to make a, a relatively, I won't call it extremely reliable, but I'll call it highly reliable AR platform. So you have a, a platform that I think is comparatively speaking, more reliable. You have all these other factors that go with it with size, maneuverability, ergonomics, everything like this. Shootability, four points of contact, easier to shoot than a handgun. And once again, if we look in the context of, of if I can get them to just leave the house without trading rounds, that's still a win. Well, if somebody comes around the corner with a, with a revolver and somebody comes around the corner with an AR, I'm going to be stepping towards the door if I'm a bad guy. But I might have a little more pep in my step if I recognize that's a rifle and not a handgun, right? Um, so, so for those things, and of course, then we look at price, right? ARs are, are arguably the most common semi-automatic rifle out there nowadays. And I routinely see them on sales in different places for five, six, seven hundred dollars $700. So they're kind of in that that Walmart shotgun type special, your Kmart shotgun, or if you're a fan of, um, oh, uh, God, I can't remember the movie now, uh, of uh, his S-Mart shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I can see it now. Um, uh, anyways, um, and somebody will jump in and know what movie I'm talking about, the little horror zombie movie that was a cult classic. Uh -huh. with, uh Anyway, so he's like, this is my boomstick, you know, and he's like the S-Mart special, you know, instead of Kmart. And, uh, but, you know, so uh, the, the access to a, a quality AR that's competitively priced before you kit it out with all this stuff that you don't have to, um, I, I think that's, I think that's a better option. And of course, uh, then that just rolls into the handguns, you know, um, I would, you know, people will make the argument that the revolver is the ultimate reliability. Well, Not. here's what I, here, my take on this is that part of being reliable is durable. And from a mechanical point of view, have we solved the riddle of how to make a revolver reliable? Yes, we well, pull the trigger, the, the cylinder indexes and all this, right? we've solved that riddle, how to make a nine millimeter semi-auto reliable, right? But I know just umpteen, I don't even know if umpteen's a word, the amount of documented instances of nine millimeter Glocks shooting over 40,000 rounds on them and still working as good as round one, show me a revolver that's got 40,000 rounds on it that doesn't have cylinder shake, end shake, the timing issues, forcing cone, you know, springs yeah, but, internally. You know, at that point though, we're we're getting out of the context of of this overall discussion. If it's I'm taking someone down to the gun store and I'm buying a new revolver, I take them to the to the range, show them how to load it. They put a few rounds to it, and then they're going to go put it in their nightstand drawer. That revolver is never going to run into those issues. Well, that's fair. And then, then you can also say that, that the semi-autos in the nine millimeter platform, right. I, uh, you know, for, yeah. for a hundred rounds, 
I'll put a modern semi-auto against a revolver and and oh, yeah. now now statistically is a revolver or is a is a the revolver going to outperform probably but with your high quality nine millimeters that we talked about at the beginning of the show i think virtually uh, once again i think we've solved the riddle of a reliable nine millimeter and a striker fire gun the striker fire guns give us a double action like trigger that is much easier to manipulate easier to control um you have uh, just everything that goes with it so yeah. so really you know kind of when i look at this critically for for that beginner i'm I'm going to go a semi-auto or some version of, of an AR, you know, depending on, on what they, what their needs are, you know? Well, I'm, I'm going to throw this out though, as far as the AR and, and by AR, I mean, every one of that class of rifle that has the, the, the straight yeah. stock with the super high sights and everything. Sure. Agreed. Um, mechanical offset is a huge issue. And if we can't get patrol cops to understand that, how are we going to get this context, the people in the context of this conversation to understand that? So for mechanical offset, I mean, when you look in the context of, of home defense and the distances we're looking at, the only real time I think mechanical offsets going to apply is your traditional, you know, hostage situation, mm -hmm. right? Is it going to matter in a, in a home defense situation that, I aim center mass and I gut shot him because I didn't take mechanical offset into account. Um, and we've, we, we've talked about stuff where, you know, we, we've seen guys, Hey, thanks. Um, well, not, it made, it, it's not going to matter in that context, but where will is like rolling out around the corner around some sort of cover and my sights are clear, but my muzzle's not. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now that's, that's a real issue. Yeah. Um, you can have that. We, you know, um, we built some brand new VTAC barricades, take them to the range, take the first rifle class out there, explain mechanical offset. The instructor that's actually teaching the block gets up and shows all of that where the sights are clear, but the muzzle's not and everything. Very first round from a student right through mm -hmm. the wood on our brand new VTAC barricade, even after all of that. And you know, I <laughs> that it's one of my big gripes with the AR platform and everything else that goes along sure. everything that falls into that and, um, and i'll and, and i'll include this in there right mm -hmm. um all of your pistol caliber carbines yeah. you know any version of a carbine you know now i like the 556 because it gives me some better terminal performance right but um you know if if that is an issue and it can be all right because once again you and I look at this from a successful gun point, point of view, right? right? You know, if the round doesn't get to the bad guy because I put it in the wall while well, I'm not being effective, right. right? But if I'm a homeowner and I crank three quick rounds into my door frame because I didn't do an accident and he runs out the front door, is that still a win? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's probably a better win because now I don't have to deal with shootings and court, you know, he's gone, yeah. right? So, so for you and I and these other guys, you know that's a that's a concern and and the ar that's a, that's always going to be one of the downsides mechanical offset we constantly have to harp on that and there but there are other solutions to that, right there's other platforms you know um uh a ruger mini 14 mm -hmm. you know now we don't have those issues right but we still have a, a handy relatively reliable carby um and and there's a whole host of of other ones we could run down um, but no, that's that's legitimate. That's that's absolutely the mechanical offset is is an issue with an AR. It always has been, and uh, you know unless you get some really low mounted optics, um, you know it, it's it's going to be something that can cause a problem. But when I put it in that context of, well, if I'm cranking rounds, that thing's going to be so loud inside. Whoever's in there is probably going to be. I find it very difficult, or I don't say difficult. Um, I think the the research or the data that shows how many bad guys were committed enough to stay in the house and continue to trade rounds and overcome a homeowner for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I think they're probably going to be statistically probably going to be very few and far between. Yeah. So for me, even if a homeowner puts a couple of rounds into a wall from offset and that guy leaves, I'm still putting that in the win column. Now, me and you... 
you know, and people, you know, that the experts we're we're that's not going to be a win for us necessarily yeah. because we're going to recognize it we're like oh my god you know i'm you know i train all this time you know why do i still have this deficiency you know this happened that person could have maneuvered around it could you know we throw all kinds of what if scenarios in there but for that context wow. of that beginning homeowner they just want them gone yeah. and they really don't care if the rounds hit them or if they put three into a wall because they didn't do the offset so I agree with you. It's an issue that we have to train and, it, and it's always going to be an issue. But in this context, I don't necessarily know if that defeats the recommendation. Yeah. Um, one little system that I've really taken a liking to, and they were readily available at one of my local gun shops. I don't know how this is going to apply across the country. Uh, Thompson Center was making a clone of the Ruger 1022. Mm -hmm. and you could get it with a very lightweight magpul stock aperture sights you know ghost ring sights with fiber optic front picatinny rail on top uh threaded which this is not going to come into play for the for the context of what we're talking about but for you can guys can easily put a suppressor on it and everything like that uh under 400 bucks and it accepts the ruger bx magazines mm -hmm. well guess what's sitting is my first access right now. Thompson Center with the Ruger BX-15 magazine in it with a CC IMO and a little red dot on top of it. So is it long rifle or is it Magnum? It's long rifle. Uh -huh. It's long rifle. And, uh, you know, going out and testing, I know that I can bring it snap shoot and put the dot inside of a two inch circle and I don't have the mechanical offset issues that, that, that we just talked about and it's lightweight it's not going to be as loud it's not going to blow out your drums it's not going to do out any other thing i think it accomplishes all the things that we've been talking about now ballistically it's not five five six ballistically it's not nine millimeter um but i have found that rifle to be very very mechanically sound mm -hmm. with, with with the quality ammunition in it and i i think it checks all those boxes lightweight no recoil um functions well etc yeah of course my only my only counter to that is just going to be your terminal ballistics oh. you know that's uh that's it i mean you know well, hold on now hold on now if you can play the card that written rounds in the wall and they run out is a win i can have my shoot them with 22 when they run out no win i agree i agree my five five six is going to make a lot more noise. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm going to have a little more pep in my step. But I, I uh, just I really don't think that people that aren't committed, the bad guy that's committed, that's going to take ten rounds and still keep coming charging down you and beat you to death with your empty shotgun, um, or whatever. He's not going to be dissuaded. But any the people that are going to run off are going to run off whether it's a yeah if it's a, I, if it's a twenty two or a three eighty. Yeah, I I would tend to agree with that. I can't I can't yeah. make a good argument against that. Yeah. Um, now yeah. I do uh, do understand all the arguments against rimfire ammunition, etc. Um, as far as the reliability of that goes, uh, what I have found with the CCI ammo in this in this platform, it works really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the the only time I've had any kind of feeding malfunction is in like a two or three hundred round session, and it just finally got so dirty that it started started to you know i had to go wipe off a little crud on it put a little more oil on it right but uh it, you know that that rifle cleaned and and with this good quality ammo hasn't been problematic at all it's actually been very pleasantly reliable more mm. reliable than my actual ruger 1022 right yeah now once again just for me that's you know for you and i at, at our level you know, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to want something that gives me terminally some more, more options, right. you know, but in that context, somebody starts, starts, you know, starts rounds in a two-way conversation mm -hmm. then yeah, they're probably, <laughs> that guy's probably going to try and get out. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then, then that's your, your real issue then becomes the committed guy. You know, the, the guy on drugs, the guy that's a psycho, the guy that, you know, for whatever reason, he becomes committed, then, then the 22, you know, it's going to be death by a thousand cuts, right? And, um, you know, 
that, that guy and, that's truly committed takes a little though, more time <laughs> yeah that guy that's truly committed though is you, you you've got to i don't say kill them to stop them but you have to physically incapacitate them correct to stop them right. and uh yeah i get to that point so that's the case i want my 12 gauge refill of flight control eight pellet buckshot sure. sure um which i have readily available as well <laughs> um but you know we're not talking about us right right nope not at all yeah and so. the, the other the other aspect i like of that little 1022 clone is for like people with a you know driving age teenage children if it's a situation where they have to leave the home or whatever like that okay throwing that 1022 in the car and driving to grandma's you know to get away if that's the case or driving somewhere you run into less legal issue than you would with them under 21 possessing a handgun uh, hopefully 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 our badge toting brethren would not care about that right in that circumstance but you would you would hope <laughs> you would hope one would hope but yeah. i have learned that uh hopes are often dashed when it comes to <laughs> some, some of those things well i think uh somebody once said hope is not a plan right <laughs> so yeah yeah so uh so yeah that's uh that's kind of why i uh i like i like those recommendations and why kind of why i don't or i'm not a fan of uh you know revolvers and shotguns for for the new shooter yeah. yeah it's going back to the revolvers one more time in teaching classes through the sheriff's office for the for the citizenry we, we usually do a a couple of free safety classes a year we haven't been able to do one in the last couple of years because of all the world stuff but um what we found were lots of ladies come that their husband boyfriend gun shop guy dad left and left them or you know passed away and left them a revolver older ladies whose husband have died and the husband had a revolver in the nightstand whatever or they've gone to the gun store and have been sold this they come down with these little 38 revolvers and not only do we have the issue of they don't have the hand strength to press the trigger on that they can't handle the recoil yes as well um that's an issue mm -hmm. that is very much an issue uh if you can find the little ruger lcr 327 and shoot it with 32 longs that alleviates that but finding that knowing to find that is is another issue yeah that's uh you know as i understand from you that's a pretty desirable combination they they mm -hmm. tend to be tough to find um I think ammunition is probably a challenge to find for that stuff in these current times. You know, it's you find 38, 357 anywhere, you know. Well, it's funny though, in in the last couple of years, 38's been very hard to find. Um when I went to pick up my 327, I walked into it in Academy Sports, and there was more 32 long on the shelf in that Academy Sports than all of the other 32 long I've seen in my lifetime combined. And I bought 500 rounds of it and there was still, oh, over yeah. and there were still over a thousand on the shelf. Oh, you know, I'm a big fan of, uh, yeah. Buy it cheap and stack it deep. Yeah. Well, it wasn't cheap. It was not cheap at all. <laughs> well, um, but I went down the road to another gun shop and they had 32 longs in stock as well. Wow. I, uh, I can't remember the last time. Now, to okay. be fair, I haven't really looked for it. Right. But I can't remember the last time I came across just casually like a 32 long. Yeah. It's kind of funny when we went through this whole ammo crunch that we've gone over the last couple of years. When it first started to sit in and you started seeing people say they couldn't find nine, they couldn't find five, five, six in bulk. I got online and immediately ordered a bunch of 3030 and a bunch of 65 Grendel. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, got well stocked up mm -hmm. to last me for a while. Uh, now I'm not going out and burning through it or anything else like that. But I've got enough ammo to handle my needs until hopefully the, the ammo comes back online. But, you know, what are the ammo manufacturers focused on? Getting nine, my, getting nine millimeter and five, five, right. six back. And now you, now you can't find some of the traditional hunting calibers. Right. And everything coming back in online mm -hmm. so yeah. it, it's it's 
Tom Givens always has a quote, this is America, we can get more. And that just hasn't proven the case. No, 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 no. But, you know, that's, uh, I think I saw somewhere where there was, God, I can't remember the number, but there was some some number that said, uh, like last year, uh, so many million first time new shooters. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you just look at, well, if, if, five million first time new shooters if each of them buys a hundred rounds just two boxes of ammo i mean how many hundreds of millions of rounds of ammo is that that's a stress on the industry that's already behind that they didn't have to deal with the year before yeah you know so uh yeah well the good news the the good news is though is that the beretta holding company which owns norma ammo uh just announced they're building a huge new ammo manufacturing facility here in Georgia is going to be down in the Savannah area. And so hopefully that's going to, going to help. Them. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity um, in that industry. I mean, I remember, what was it? I think right now the only military ammunition plant we have online is Lake city, but like during world war II, we had something like 11 plants online, yeah. you know, and uh yeah, I mean, there's 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 opportunity out there for for business, and if you can get the components and have the connections, and I mean, it's mm-hmm. like primers. I mean, primers yeah. are primers are more valuable than gold right now in in the reloader community. You know, primers, and it's one of those things where, just from being on the competition side, I had enough primers, kind of, you know, just ready to go for loading for practice ammo, and I was able to I've been able to stretch that out and not not use them as much, but. Um, yeah, I mean, really, the the primer market. And there's supposed to be some new company coming online pretty soon too. But uh, yeah. the primer is really, really tough to find right now. Of course, the cynic in me, you know, might be willing to believe the conspiracy theories that some of the major manufacturers that used to sell primers are are not selling them in an effort to force some of the boutique manufacturers out of business, so they won't wow. have that competition. Uh, wow, you know, I mean, but that's right up there with. Uh, you know the the conspiracy theories that pharmaceutical companies don't cure you because they just want to treat your symptoms because a sick person yeah. makes them more money than a cured person well maybe <laughs> but uh, eric where can people find you oh man so um oh well sure. before we get to that was there anything else you wanted to say on the no, no, no. On that, we talked. Uh, I don't know how our time was, but I know we had a couple of backup topics ready to go yeah. if we needed to. So we I don't are know. If at an hour and sixteen minutes at this current time. Uh, you got anything we can knock out in fifteen minutes? No. Nah. All right, we'll save it for another time. <laughs> yeah. So for those out there uh, uh, in uh, in listening land, uh, we've been talking about potentially doing a PDW discussion so if you want to hear that uh i guess hit up lee and let him know that uh that might be something you'd be interested in or any of the other topics but uh but no um so no that's good um right now primarily i'm gonna try to probably in the spring try to do some local classes again uh i just haven't been able to and then with covid with the ammo shortage and of course uh i am fortunate enough to be in your area of operations and uh you are quite successful so uh uh, a lot of times I just rather just jump on the line and practice and jump in your class than actually have to get in front and teach. But, uh, uh, but primarily right now I'm doing long range. Um, I've, I've kind of gotten the long range. There is a huge, um, interest in long range hunting and, uh, and kind of just to set that stage. Uh, we have a bunch of people that, uh, want to go out west and they want to hunt pronghorn and they want to do elk and they they want to do that well they come to the outfitters or the guides or the places they want to go and you want to run a pronghorn antelope you know a 400 yard shot is normal and so these guides are telling these guys hey you know you got to be able to shoot out four or five six hundred yards are you comfortable and we get responses like do bullets go that far <laughs> you know because if you're east of the mississippi you know you're you're a tree stand that's 50 75 100 yards and that's all you know if so, that right so um so i ended up uh I, I do some work with a company called outdoor solutions and it's uh the website's outdoor solutions corp corp.com 
and uh, it's an outdoor hunting and fishing adventures and they have a long range school and so i uh, i instruct through that school and basically we we teach long range hunting uh we'll take you out to a thousand yards teach you how to use the scopes and ballistic profiles and true up your data and everything that goes with it and it's important to realize that we are not advocating you go hunt 100 yards it's the whole um train hard fight easy process where you know if you are confident hitting a target at a thousand yards hitting a target at 400 is easy right you have a lot more confidence in that shot and so uh we do some things like that and so right now i'm i'm, I'm mostly tied up doing a lot of long range uh but no i'm still going to try to um, get some local classes in when something pops up you know uh I'll reach out for you and and kind of put it out there to people. And uh, but right now it's that. But I'm always available for if you have a private class and you know you have a range or you uh, you're interested in in a certain type of training. You know I'll I'll put my show on the road just like you do. So you can just uh, reach out for me through um, uh, through Instagram um, and my company name is All Fire Dynamics and it's the company on Instagram. You just hit me right up there if you got any questions or anything else. All right. You know, it, I'm amused at the whole long range shooting for antelope and et cetera. Uh, was driving through a small town in Wyoming, and the biggest antelope buck I've ever seen was standing right there in the middle of town. <laughs> and uh, I've been in, in a town in South Dakota, and there's like bucks walking down the center of the street, like on the uh, WLA line. I'm like, why do people go out in the woods and like in the middle of nowhere to try to find them? They're right here in town. Oh, well, those are the domesticated ones. I think um, I think I saw somewhere like pronghorn have something stupid because they have the eyes on the side of their head mm -hmm. and they have they have vision like eagles, yeah. like just insanely high level vision. And because their eyeballs are on the side of their heads, they, they get a scan of something like 290 degrees without ever moving their head. And then if they just move their head a little bit left or right, they mm -hmm. see 360 around them and they're in herds. Yeah. So it's, you know, they will, they will bust you in a second from 400 yards away and be gone. And then they run over the next ridge and then you got to hump a mile to get to the next ridge and only to get busted again and keep chasing them across the plains. It's a, yeah. uh, it's a, uh, it can be frustrating, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, there's just a lot of interest in it. And I just find, uh, I mean, for me personally, I mean, as an instructor, I'm invested in, in my student success. And a uh, thousand yards is just such a, a standard, you know, for long range. And um, I will say with our program and how we teach it in, in the five or six years I've done it and the hundreds of students I've had are probably e maybe even getting over a thousand. Um, we have never not had a student hit the thousand yard steel. We have a perfect success rate so far. You know, and that goes to, I think, the quality instruction, um, the equipment we provide, the program that we run. And, uh, you know, so seeing them get excited when they show up and they see how far a thousand yards is and they've only ever shot a 100 or 200 yards. And you see that lane and you see those thousand yards. And by the end of the next day or the end of that first day, they're ringing the steel at will. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy seeing that. So. I would love to go out there in West. The, the furthest, of course, I love going out West every chance I get. The furthest I've ever actually shot measured was 200 yards. Mm -hmm. And so it would be kind of fun to try to stretch that out a little bit, a little bit beyond that. And see. Yeah, man. Grab that, uh, grab that Grendel and we'll go out and hunt some hogs. I'll get you, you some, I'll get you some shots over 200. There you go. I, Cause I love killing pigs. Oh man. It, it is so much fun. It has become uh, a new passion for me. It actually has. Yeah. And, and it needs to be done. It is a social good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's straight eradication. They are just literally, it's one of the, one of the, the few animals that you can't kill them quick enough to control the populations. Right. You and know? they're devastating, absolutely yeah. devastating to everything around them. Yeah. Yeah, they are. So, uh, and but yeah, yeah, we'll get that rifle one of these times. We we go out west, teach a class or something, uh, sure. we'll swing by a couple of places I know and see if we can't knock some down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Eric, it's always great to talk to you and uh, and uh, enjoy shooting with us last week. I know we got another one coming up soon. Yes, and we do. And, looking, uh, looking, go ahead. 
Oh, thank you for having me on. I, I enjoy sitting down and chatting with you. And, uh, and I hope I did my part to break the internet a little bit for you. Well, you, you know, I'm, I was just sitting here thinking if we didn't plan it this way, but all right, people that are driving to Thanksgiving dinner, you know, with their family, if they listen to this episode on the way or before that, you know, maybe they'll offer some better advice at, at, at this time than what they would have. And uh, I'm sure we'll get some people that get upset and won't like it. And and those will, those comments will be on YouTube. The knowing comments will be in, in the Facebook group. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll jump in on those things too. So, sure. uh, so yeah, you got some stuff and, uh, you know, uh, I love to hear counterpoints and, uh, you know, and hear other people's thoughts. Uh, that, I mean, that's the idea, right? We want to sure. provoke discussion, provoke some critical thinking and mm -hmm. uh, really critically think about uh, what, what kind of recommendations us as the so-called experts are putting out to people and, and sure. think about is, is what we're putting out there really in their best interest, yeah. you know, given their context. It's a shame that you can't just walk in any gun store and find a super duper quality <laughs> M1 carbine still. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there, at there's some out there. Price, at an affordable price. Yeah. Uh, I, guess I think even, it, yeah. isn't even a spear making some some good defensive ammunition for it now? Yeah. Yeah. I think the closest thing you could actually get to that in current modern day production right now, though, would be the Ruger PC9. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. Because uh, it gives everything I just said about the 1022 clone earlier. In a more reliable platform with centerfire ammo and mm -hmm. more effective ammunition, but still there you're looking at. Oh gosh, the standard one I looked at yesterday was five hundred and something. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but you're also you know you, you've got other situations you got to deal with there as far as uh, uh, stock length and everything else. But they do have versions that are available that have adjustable stocks and stuff on them. And I'll tell you, I mean, uh, I know we're trying to wrap it up, but yeah. man, I'm a big fan of an M1 Grand room clearing. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's plenty of there's plenty of Germans that uh, were were thoroughly impressed by by what our grandfathers did with those things across the room. <laughs> yeah, but those aren't exactly uh, user friendly for the. For the <laughs> well, yeah, I can't yeah. give you that one. Yeah. Maybe that maybe that's an intermediate system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but there's no yeah. no offsite issues. <laughs> no, there's not that. Uh, and uh, Uncle Howard did some hellacious work with the uh, the uh, BAR according yes. to his records. Yes, because so, uh, uh, you know I, I think I heard it somewhere is uh, you know why why would you use a thirty out six for uh, for home defense? And my response is because shooting twice is stupid. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. And with that, everyone, uh, we know that your most important asset is your time. And thank you for choosing to spend it with us.